Hello, BookTube. As I mentioned just yesterday, we're right on the edge of a new month of April. And that is spurring a lot of April TBR, April pile of possibilities, that sort of thing, videos uh, that I love watching. I love seeing the provisional shape of your reading dreams, even if it doesn't work out that way. I love I love hearing about that, love the, the plans, love the fresh, clean slate of possibilities for any new month. And I feel the same way myself. There's a little bit more doom and gloom associated with the way that I feel because the remit that I've given myself for reading, we all do this. We all set the parameters of our reading. Even someone like myself who says I'm a very eclectic reader, it's not totally open. It, there's, we still set our parameters. Uh, and the parameters that I've set for myself forever and ever are the new releases in the American book market in the 10 or 15 genres that interest me. I do a lot of other reading because I do nothing else, <laughs> but I do a lot of other reading, but I do a lot of that. And that's naturally causing me to look at publisher catalogs and publicist emails and whatnot and see the shape of the coming month. And I figured, why not share all of that with you or a lot of that with you? Part of it is is uh, motivated off camera. It's motivated off stage. In addition to being a sexy influencer uh, with a snub nose and raven hair that's so black it's almost blue and eight pack abs and the whole nine yards that you can see with your own eyes. Uh, I'm also the books editor, the book section editor for a print newspaper in Northern Georgia, a very small print newspaper in Northern Georgia that has nevertheless decided on the courageous and almost unprecedented step of having a dedicated book section. So my book's coverage is not a review here and there tucked into a broader art section. It has its own section. And every month, those of you who have done me the honor of subscribing to Big Canoe News in Northern Georgia will know that every month it's a two-page spread. It looks beautiful. The production design people we have are fantastic. Uh, but there were advertising vagaries and space allocation shiftings this time around. Uh, and I was told that my section would be one page instead of two. I groused for about half a second, and then I reminded myself and my editor that that's still more than most newspapers do. Uh, but since there was a gigantic contraction of space, literally half the size, uh, things had to go. And any self-respecting editor who is not a raving eomaniac will say that his own thing should go first. I do a regular column for Big Canoe about new releases, upcoming new releases. And uh, that just, there was no way that I could justify putting that in there. So this is partially motivated by a desire to talk about those new releases that isn't quite being alleviated in a print newspaper, which is, because I'm a million years old, my venue of choice. <laughs> so, so we'll go over a few more here. Uh, I've got them on the iPad here. We'll see what we have and what might be of interest. What might interest to you? What might interest you more than it interests me? Some of these I've read. <laughs> Others I have pretty firm opinions about. But as with the last video and the last 3 million TBR videos that I've done on this channel, I would like to think that most people are aware of the fact that I can have a really strong opinion about an upcoming book. This looks like trash. And it can surprise me. I go into the book when the moment comes with a completely open mind. <clears throat> I know that there are a tiny, tiny handful of people who hate watch this channel, and you are not going to believe that. In fact, that's going to send you into spasms of rage, but it's nevertheless true. It's nevertheless true. So we will see. Even the ones that I'm negatively disposed towards here might end up pleasing me. Uh, unfortunately, the first book I have actually read, we saw it on this channel. This is by David Roll, who's done good work, and this is Ascent to Power, uh, which is about Harry Truman taking over the American government from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who died in office, died in harness. Uh, and typically, in a mass market, not not the size necessarily, but the intended audience, a very a very gen an uncritical general audience of history readers, typically books like this will be. Uh, a celebration of Harry Truman's flinty, no-nonsense, ordinary guy-ness. Uh, typically, books like this will juxtapose that kind of uh, bird-like general store manager in a little town air that Truman very calculatedly gave off against the weird, otherworldly patrician sheer size and scope of FDR 
who knew perfectly well, and so did all of his friends, and so did all of his enemies, even in the middle of his second term, every one of those people knew that this was a figure who would be remembered forever. Not every president is, and most presidents don't deserve to be, but this, everyone knew he was a giant. And Roosevelt also knew that. It didn't, I believe, go to his head in the way that it does to some people who know that, uh, including some of his World War II era contemporaries. Uh, but nevertheless, he knew it. I think he was more allowing for it in his very intriguing final two years than he'd ever been before in his life. Uh, so that part is true. That aura of Roosevelt is true. But the rest of it, the, the you know, can-do, you know, Missouri shop front owner, haberdashery guy stuff, you don't get to be a professional politician. You don't end up being vice president of the United States if any of that is true. I know that it's an illusion that politicians like to polish, but it's no more true then than it is now. And this book goes into that just really hard. It goes into that really, really hard. This is... Uh, I won't say that it's not readable. It's very readable. but it So it's not boring. But, which ordinarily on this channel you would think is my my harshest criticism of any book, is to call it boring. But if it's a work of history, uh, even one that, you know, for all, I only, had, I only read the, uh, the Unbound Galley of this thing, so I have no idea whether or not it's going to continue the unbelievably noxious current trend in academic publishing, in historical publishing, of not having an index, not having a bibliography. If it doesn't have any supporting material, whether it does or not, uh, with a work like this, Boring is the second worst criticism I can make of it. Uh, the worst criticism I can make of it is uh, credulous. And because that serves nobody. That actually does harm. I, I don't know. I don't think, if you read popular World War II history, if you are, have a whole shelf of FDR books, as you easily could, he's an endlessly fascinating figure. If you've read, for instance, uh, David McCullough's doorstop biography of Harry Truman, which is really, really good. If you've studied any of this, I don't think this book will please you. I think it will strike you as a horrible, horrible word for any kind of history, scholarly or general, which is uncritical. To say nothing of the fact that Harry Truman dropped two atomic bombs on two cities in Japan and was willing to drop more. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the rape of Nanking. We can talk about the firebombing of Dresden. We can talk about the Holocaust. But if we're going to talk about the crimes, the seismic crimes committed during World War II, under the umbrella of World War II, that has to be on the list. At the top of the list. That has to be right up at the top, nudging the others. The incineration of two whole cities with a bomb that Truman did not know for sure wouldn't do much worse than it did. But he had intelligence reports. He knew perfectly well what it would do. He knew that it was ten orders of magnitude worse even than the systematic firebombing campaigns that had been done on uh, German cities. He knew that it was worse. That not only would the scope of the destruction be worse, but also that the nature of the destruction would be worse. And he gave the authorization anyway when he didn't need to. You you might say, and I apologize for Truman have been saying for, what, 70 years, uh, that he was looking at projections made by the War Department that uh, the Japanese would defend their empire island by island and that an island-hopping campaign would cost enormous numbers of American lives and that he was trying to cut that arithmetic short. Uh, that isn't... That might be true. Of course, you can't know for sure what a, what a hypothetical will be. But it doesn't change the fact that he could have picked an uninhabited atoll, drawn the whole world's eyes to that atoll, and incinerated it. And said to the Empire of Japan, I have more of these bombs. The atoll that, you, that your plane reconnaissance showed you existed yesterday, your plane reconnaissance today will show you that it doesn't exist today, and that the area is saturated with high-level radiation. If you don't surrender, I will drop one of these on Tokyo. You have 24 hours. He didn't do that. That might have failed. You Okay, you might argue that that would have failed. Maybe so. 
there were factions, two competing factions in the emperor's cabinet, and it was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday that any one of them had control. It might not have succeeded. It was worth a try. I'm pretty sure that 20,000 vaporized people would say it's worth a try. I'm pretty sure that thousands and thousands of vaporized babies and children would say it's worth a try. But he didn't do it. Uh, so... Anyway, anyway, this was, we're not starting off promisingly because this was not, uh, particularly good. It was, it's meant for dad in the worst possible sense that of that phrase. It's meant for dad. It's meant for a, a totally uncritical, sentimental, general interest history buff in the way that no one should ever be. No matter what your subject should is, you should never content yourself with being just a buff. What does that mean? Oh, it's just, I'm not saying there's not a market for the book, but it was, this was a disappointment. This author can do much better work. And this next one is something that we've seen before. I showed it to you, but now I've, I've since then read it. I haven't seen it in physical form, uh, which I imagine is, is its best form. Uh, so, you know, take my, my uh, thoughts with a grain of salt because it might be just a gorgeous thing to hold in the lap and turn the pages. But this is by Amy Tan, and this is the Backyard Bird Chronicles. Uh, where she describes, and in general terms, she's not an expert at all, she's just a, a backyard bird watcher, she describes in general terms uh, the birds who most frequent her backyard, her area, uh, the day, the weather, their attitude, whether or not they're aware of her, and she does amateur sketches that are quite charming. This, I was worried that this would be pompous, and it's not. Uh, the Amy Tan, in her occasional prose, not her fiction, but her occasional prose, has a tendency to pomposity that's only going greater with time. But this was engaged and happy throughout. Nothing new here, nothing, no no penetrating ornithological insults, insights or, or natural history writing of any kind. Just an utterly charming book that, I, again, I think that its charm would only be increased by her, you know, by seeing her pictures in on a, on a nice page in front of you in the sunlight. Uh, so I have, I, I approve of this book. I liked it. I, I could think right away of people I would give it to, people who would like it, other backyard birders who maybe don't have the ankles or the lower back or the area uh, to go out tramping, looking for things. You have to wait for them to come to you. If, if People like that, and I imagine that's a lot of bird lovers in this country, uh, this is going to be wonderful. They're just going to love you. Know somebody like that. They're going to want this book. Uh, and this next one I have not read. It looks to me like uh, a familiar gambit. I've seen other authors do this. Other legal pop thriller authors do this. I always reflexively call it a bid for respectability. I don't always know that that's true. It could be just that that's where their yen takes them. The author here is David Baldacci, who has certainly made enough a good enough living from his books so that he can take a flyer on a book. And certainly he's been successful enough in his publishing career so that his publisher will let him. And this is historical fiction. This is his new book, A Calamity of Souls. You can tell right away it's designed to look different than any of his other books. And it is different. It's a historical drama about racial tensions in the South. I don't even... I've read a bunch of David Baldacci. Probably there are a lot of you who've read a lot more of him than I have. But I've read a bunch of him, and uh, I can't imagine this author doing what I reflexively... Now, don't jump all over me. I reflexively refer to it as serious fiction. And I think you know what I mean. I'm not a snob. I don't mean it that way. I mean the kind of plot-driven, court-driven, twist-driven stuff that he's done most often. This scene, The description of this seems like it's not going to be that at all. There's still legal stuff involved, but it seems like it's, it's going to try for more than that. And believe it or not, that does not meet with cynicism on my part. I have seen other authors try this and wholeheartedly succeed. Greg Isles is a perfect example. <laughs> but there have been others. I, I've seen authors try this sort of thing. I, I, I think I might be the only person in the world <laughs> who, uh, who thoroughly applauded Robert Parker's All Our Yesterdays, one of his historical novels. I think I'm one of the only people that, that wholeheartedly loved that book. This could be really good. It could please me in a way that the author's more gimmicky, plot-driven stuff never has. I've never I've read some David Baldacci. I've never been a fan. We'll see. Uh, is is this is he masking what is basically a legal thriller? 
under the, the trappings of other stuff, or is he trying something different? And if so, will it will it snare me? I will report back. I will let you know. And this next one is Gene Becker, uh, who was the major domo, the chief of staff for George H.W. Bush forever and ever and ever. Not necessarily uh, a power broker in George H.W. Bush's White House, but definitely the the person organizing things behind the scenes for so many decades just so many and uh there is now a book by this person it's called character matters and other lessons from george hw bush bush senior who i'm uh, alarmed of course to realize a great number of my readers will not know from living memory which is amazing to me just uh, readers i said readers and uh, viewers i mean viewers uh, it's amazing to me that this figure has receded into history when he seems so contemporary to me uh i <laughs> i fulminated against him quite a bit in print uh little did i guess just little did i guess i just i literally had no idea how bad things could get i was i fulminated against him in the same way that a whole bunch of other editorial writers did, and also a whole bunch of humorists did, which is that he was a goof, a, a bit of a moron. Uh, little did I guess. <laughs> I had no idea that his son would ever become president. I read the long profile, I think it was in Vanity Fair, of, uh, of George H.W. Bush and his wife, Barbara Bush. And at one point, the reporter follows them to a big you know, touch football game, the whole family outside, a whole uh, cookout, the whole nine yards, everybody having fun and laughing. The mother looks across the playground at, the, at her then 30-something son, George W. Bush, and says, that, guy's, that, that kid sees the world through turd-colored glasses. Obviously did not like him. <laughs> Even then thought he was an utterly self-absorbed, idiotic wastrel. I read that piece and thought, well, thank God we don't have hereditary politics in this country. <laughs> you should have known better. The Adamses came from Boston. I should have known better. But uh, there's been a strong attempt in the last 30 years to uh, burnish the reputation of George H.W. Bush as a good man, a disciplined, decent man who stood beyond politics, who was not just a political creature. Actually, it's the same kind of rehabilitation, rehabilitation efforts that go on with Truman. And you can see right away the thing, the kind of thing I'm talking about. No matter what you think about FDR, he is bigger than any kind of attempt like that. You, you know with FDR that you're dealing with the real live currents, the actual striated muscle of history. And so you can't, there's no, there's no use at all in burnishing him. You just have to deal with him. The gigantic, sprawling, irreconcilable reality of him. There's nothing like that with Harry Truman, and there's nothing like that with George H.W. Bush. Nothing at all like that. The closest that anyone has ever done to rendering this character as someone genuinely interesting, not great and not even good, but genuinely interesting, was Richard Ben Kramer in his great book, What It Takes when Bush was known by his family nickname of Poppy. The the Bush in that gigantic book, easily suitable for March of the Mammoths as it wanes, uh, the Bush in that book is fascinating in a way that most of these later attempts at Bush are not. Although some of those attempts have been successful. For instance, famously, you'll, you'll see it at a used bookstore, famously decades ago, a couple of decades ago, there was a big volume of the collected letters of George H.W. Bush that I was ready to hate. I had my cutlery out and nice and sharp, and I loved it. I, was, I totally fell into that book. I thought it was fantastic. And it's, a lot of it seemed unfeigned. A lot of it seemed like, okay, maybe there is something to this attempt to burnish this character's reputation into being into <laughs> revealing him as as a fairly simple, not stupid, but fairly simple and honorable man. And then John Meacham wrote a biography. John Meacham has a piece in here. I, I, John Meacham wrote a biography that was it was very very good. Meacham really it's it's you it, you be you have to work really hard to get him on a bad day when he's in front of a typewriter. He's he's really good on the page, but. <sighs> maybe maybe it's just the fact that for me bush is a figure of living memory this bush both bushes are a figure of, he's a figure of living memory so when i read somebody a, a best-selling you know msnbc talking head biography of this guy i want 
170 pages on Iran Contra, and I think I got two. I want, uh, <laughs> I want all all sorts of deep digging into this guy's finances, especially in the immediate wake of World War II. Are they going to be there? No. And why? Well, you either have to say it's because it would take a lot of work, but Meacham's not afraid of work and he has a staff. Or you have to say, if you did that, you'd get results you don't want. And you know that. So you're not going to do it. Both are bad. <laughs> Both are bad. But to a, to a limited extent, this book looks like it's going to try and sidestep all of that and just be a collection of affectionate reminiscences of George H.W. Bush. If it's only that and doesn't try to do anything else, there are a couple of historians who have entries here, so I find that hard to believe. But if it only does that, then this it might be credulous, it might be you know, incurious, but it will be harmless. Uh, we, we will see. Uh, we will see. Uh, this next one, this is by Leif Anger. Uh, we don't need to discuss... Uh, my long-standing beefs with Leaf Anger. We don't need to discuss those at all. They aren't important. All that's important is the work, right? Uh, this is his new novel, I Cheerfully Refuse, about a man who is on a quest, on a boat, on a weird version of a lake that seems to be alive, uh, for his quirky, manic pixie dream girl wife. Uh, I haven't read this. But I'm sure that there are tweet digressions everywhere. I'm sure that there are sea monsters and that a lot of them have impacted teeth and that's making them grumpy. And if you only fix that, or maybe they just have an odd idea about some book they just read and you know they're just misunderstood. I will go at this with an open mind, but this is an author who is crack cocaine level addicted to gimmick and twee whimsy. And Twee Whimsy is good, maybe, for the third toast in some boring evening. It cannot sustain even a paragraph, let alone a whole book, and this guy's made a whole career out of it. So I don't I don't imagine that I'm going to like this. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I don't imagine that I'm going to like it, but we will see. We will see. Uh, then this next one, uh, this presents me with a problem for April. It, I haven't read it. I've intentionally put it off. It, I have it, but I haven't read it. It's a really, really good author, a really, really talented wordsmith, really good at character dry, at character building and insights into, into human nature that are just dropped organically into the flow of the text. High praise. High, high praise. Very much the feeling of being in the presence of Elmore Leonard at his best, or even maybe George Higgins. High praise. Uh, the author is Don Winslow, and this is his new book, City in Ruins. The last... The, the last novel of, the, of his series about one particular Irish ruffian who is a rags to riches story of him bare knuckling his way into financial respectability and finally getting the life that he's always wanted. And in this novel, that life is threatened. And he suddenly has to revert to his old violent ways to preserve it. Okay, fine. Nothing original there, but that is definitely meaty material for a book. And if you gave me, if you floated that basic hackneyed but serviceable plot to me and told me it was Don Winslow who was going to write it up, I'd be yay. I'd be saying, yay, good, great, I'll read that. Absolutely, I know I'll love it. And that's what this is, but there's going to be a cloud of white hot rage hanging over this book. I was thinking about this, uh, for, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days measuring my own reactions in videos that I had to redo because the reaction got the best of me to one particular aspect of 21st century. And that is gaslighting. That is people telling you something that you and they absolutely know is not true. And just stating it as true. That just absolutely everyone involved knows this is a lie, but I am using it to grift money. So you know that I'm doing that. I know that I'm doing that. I hate gaslighting. I don't know why, but suddenly it's occurred to me in the 20 in 2024 how much I hate it. Maybe because of how common it has become. Just everywhere how common it has become. Uh everywhere down the line. Just everywhere down the line. Uh 
And the gaslighting here is, it has nothing to do with the novel. It has nothing to do with the plot or the character. It'd be interesting to go back to these characters. I remember them from the last book. The, the gaslighting here has to do with the lie that Don Winslow is telling, that he's having his publicist tell and his publisher tell about this book, which is that it's his last novel, that he's retiring. He's not going to write any more fiction. Which, which is not only a howling, spit-in-the-face, stupid gaslighting lie, but also not even an original one. We've seen other authors make this same lie. I'm not going to set the clock here, uh, but it won't be any more than five years. Don Winslow is not an old man. It won't be any more than five years before he writes another book and says, oh, well. Or I'm assuming that, like everybody else uh, assumes when they gaslight, I'm assuming you don't remember that you have the attention span of a moth. So you won't remember that I lied to you this time. I, I don't know. It's going to be hard to, to disassociate that whopping, spit-in-the-face gaslighting lie from the actual performance in this book. All I'm, I'm sure that I'm, well, I'm going to be enjoying this. I'm sure that I will. This is a great, great author to read. But the whole time I'm reading it, I'm going to be thinking uh, inappropriate thoughts. <laughs> the whole time I'm reading it, I'm going to be thinking, how much would it cost? Probably the dark web, first of all, and false names and a Dropbox, or maybe even a couple of Dropboxes nested on top of each other, end-to-end -end encryption of communications, and $2,700 to get someone to agree uh, to wait until Don's, Don Winslow is on the book tour for this book, break into his home, and bring me the manuscript of his next book, which I am sure exists. <laughs> I just, I, those are untoward thoughts, of course. You don't want to have those thoughts when you're reading a book. But it, it, I'm going to try not to have those intrude on my reading experience, but honestly, it's as if he had said, this book is really special to me because it's the first one I've ever written in English. I've been working really hard on mastering the English language, and this is my first attempt. I'm hoping you'll go gentle on it uh, because it's my first attempt at writing a book in English. And the whole, everyone in the world is just sitting there saying, I have five books from you in English right behind me. <laughs> They're right here. And he's just serenely saying, first one in English. <sighs> so, so we will see. We will see. I would hope... Uh, <laughs> I, would hope I hope that I can concentrate past that. I don't know why he's saying such obvious nonsense, such obvious gaslighting. I would hope that I can concentrate past it. Uh, then this next one is by Michael Livingston. Uh, and this is a new... It's new military history. It's from the great folks at Osprey Press. This is the Battle of Cressy. Uh, this is the Hundred Years' War. This is a great turning point in the Hundred Years' War. It's a set-piece battle. We saw it in uh, Distant Mirror on this channel. It's a set-piece battle in the Hundred Years' War between uh, vastly greater numbers and the great Edward, Edward III, uh, in which the, the English had the victory. And I'm always up for a new study of Cressy. Always, I say, <laughs> even though last year there was a new study of Agincourt that well, it did all. It did everything it had to do. But it, it, military, there's military history and there's military history. If you if you are working mostly on momentum, and the fact that this thing has a, a forward by Bernard Cornwell thinks maybe this is acting mostly on momentum. If you're acting mostly on momentum and you write a paddle a, a paddle history of Cressy, it's going to be largely boring. I guess it'd be the same problem that I had with Ascent to Power. It'll be you know, is this written for Dad? If it is, then, you know, it might have its its positive points, but it definitely won't be for me. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, this next one is going to be a monument to self-indulgence, but there will be good bits in it. I guarantee you there will be good bits in it. This is Joseph Epstein. Uh, and this is his new collection of essays, periodical pieces, deadline prose, uh, occasional prose. Uh, called Familiarity Breeds Content. Uh, I, I get the impression from the advanced word on this thing that it will be, one substantial chunk of it will be personal essays and another substantial chunk of it will be literary reflections, which is what Joseph Epstein is really, really good at. And we'll just see. <laughs> we'll just have to see what the balance is and how insufferable the personal essays are. 
we'll we'll just have to see. I don't want to go into a. I never want to go into a book like this just saying, well, if the personal essays are all gathered together in one section and maybe called reminiscences or something like that, and I can look at the titles and see that it's going to be about having a game of catch with your dad or maybe. Uh, your drinking days or, you know, what it's like to turn 70 or something like that. If I can see that that section is like that, I'm always tempted when I can to just skip that section. Just wholesale don't read it and read the other stuff, the honest stuff. I hate that, though. I don't want to approach books that way, so I'm hoping that I don't approach this that way. We'll see. Uh, this next one is for the gays. You've got to have something for the gays. I think I have a couple of things for the gays here. This is by Alan Bratton. I don't think I've ever read that the, this author, so this may be a debut. Uh, this is called Henry Henry, and it is a contemporary gaying up retelling of uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One and Part Two, uh, uh, Henry the Fifth, uh, the redemption of Prince Hal, the the changing of uh, callow, overprivileged youth into something more than that. Maybe that's that itself is a hackneyed premise. I'm okay with hackneyed premises. Obviously, I am. Uh, I've seen that kind of thing before. If this author can hit it out of the park, I'm all for it. Absolutely all for it. Besides, it, 2024 is now, well, we're going to April. I have yet to read a single good work of gay fiction in 2024 so far. That's bad. Maybe this will be that. Maybe this will change that. Uh, and then this next one, I've, I, I saw we saw it on this channel. I read it. Boy, I guess this is the theme here, is that this is... Uh, Frida, what are you doing, baby? I swear, she goes nuts when she's not within sight of me. Frida, Frida, come here. What are you doing? Come in here. Come up here. Come on, you could do it. Come on, you could do it. There you go. There's a good girl. Uh, we saw this on this channel, and I, like I was saying before the bean interrupted me, I guess that this is sort of an unofficial theme for this this April TBR. There'll be others. We, have, we can talk about all the books in April if you want. Uh, and that theme would be Dad. This, that theme would be the armchair history buff who's not asking for much and really doesn't want to be asked much of when it comes to works of history. This is by Michael Corda, who, again, can do much better work. This is Muse of Fire, World War I through the eyes of the, the, the soldier poets, the famous ones and a couple of the non-famous ones. Uh, and... If if you know this subject, you have been here before many many times. The, I kept waiting for this book to do something, anything that I didn't expect, that so, to interrogate anything deeper than what it looks like you're going to do on the surface, and it never did. It never does. It's just a, a trot. It's a trot on the subject of World War One. You know, poets. World War I battlefield poets, these brilliant youths mowed down like poppies in the field, Flanders Field. <laughs> it, I won't say that it goes all saccharine. It's, it's not as lazy as it could be, but I, I don't know. I had, I had a friend for years and years who was a historian and a serious historian, about as serious as they get. And I used to, used to do this diatribe with him, and he used to say, well, those books serve a purpose, right? They are a doormat. They're a welcome mat to the genre of history. Not everyone is as comfortable just launching into history. The genre tends to intimidate people and those books serve a purpose. They, they ease that intimidation just a bit. I suppose that's true. Uh, I, I, there was nothing wrong with this. There was something wrong with the Harry Truman book, a Harry Truman book that is not in, that is not indict him for one of the greatest war crimes in human history is a Harry Truman book that is not just coddling you, but misleading you. Uh, this doesn't do anything like that, but the valor, the heroism, the, the war ending one month after their death, uh, the immortality of the verse, the country house interludes, uh, I maybe, uh, well, definitely, I was not this book's audience. I just, uh, just nothing, I was just turning pages. It was just, it was just so predictable that I, it wasn't it comes out in april you try it for yourself your library will certainly get it michael cord is a big name uh and this next one is by craig wilsey wills and it's more gay fiction i have something else for the gays i i don't know how i got notice of this thing uh 
I don't think it's from a mainstream publisher. Maybe it was from one of those self-published places that now send me notices for everything. Uh, but this is called Providence. Uh, and it's about a teacher in a college who is... Uh, he's in the rat race. He's in the, the rat wheel. He wanted to be a teacher at this college. He thought that that would be the dream. The walk around the campuses, get to know the students, teach them and you know, the, this this college will take care of you. And he's learning just modern finance 101, which is that that's not true, that you're not making enough money, you're you're not secure in your job at all, you're not sure about the political demands on you quite apart from your class load. So we, we have a, a harried, somewhat thwarted, narrative-focused character when all of a sudden one of his sophomores, uh, one of his new sophomores is this gorgeous, alluring young man. Uh, who seems to have it all, just seems to have everything under control. And that young student becomes an object of fascination for the teacher. And I gather, for, I haven't read this yet, but I gather that it, that at least for a while, that fascination seems to be reciprocated. Dodgy material and difficult to do well. We, we shall see. We shall see. I will definitely give it a try. I am fairly obviously now, I guess, on the lookout for good gay fiction in 2024. I've read a lot of it, but a lot of it is indie stuff with a pun on the word puck, hockey romance with a pun on the word puck, that it may have its titillating moments, but it's not good. It's it's not good in, in you know, the sense of the word that we could call it. I mean, in, in the upcoming months, we have the two reigning popes of current gay fiction, Andre Asman and Garth Greenwell, both coming out with books. Asman's is a memoir that will be mostly lies, it will be mostly fiction. And I think Greenwell's is a novel that is almost entirely nonfiction. So I guess they're going to meet in the middle of not doing what their publishers say they're doing. I, I, have, not, I have not been largely pleased with either of our two popes, so, I, so I'm always on the lookout. Uh, and then we can finish up with uh, a work of history. This would have crossed my radar anyway. I would want this anyway. Uh, because it's about Venice, and Venice is my second favorite city in the entire world, and I, I deeply love reading about it. I uh, don't want to be doom and gloomy on a bright, sunny Saturday, but I'm never going to see Venice again with my own eyes, so reading about it is the next best thing. And there's a new history coming out called Shylock's Venice, about the city's famous Jewish ghetto. I think through the ages... I, I, despite the fact that this is called Shylock's Venice, I don't think this is going to plunk down just in the, you know, the 16th century. I think this will be the life of the Jewish ghetto through the ages. There's a huge amount of documentation there. And there was a big, really good book on the Jewish ghetto in Venice over the centuries. It came out 30 or 35 years ago, and it never was translated into English. It was like 800 pages long. And it was really, really good, really thorough, a little bit on the dry side. Uh, and I'll just have to see, does, uh, what's his name? Harry Friedman. Does he know about that book? Does he consult it? It will be an odds against guess as to whether or not that's true, because most of the books like this that are coming out now from major U S publishing houses do not include a bibliography. <laughs> oh, just, just utterly unbelievable. They just don't include this absolutely indispensable aspect of what they're doing. I don't know where this fad started, and I don't know who ever told these authors that that was acceptable. Is it maybe the publishing house that can no longer afford someone to assemble a bibliography? Well, then don't publish the book. If you don't have the money to finish the product, then don't publish the book. You can't publish a history without a bibliography. It can't be some works cited. You can't just put the books you cited in your notes so that if you want to assemble a bibliography, if the reader wants to do that, they have to do it themselves by crawling through the notes under barbed wire. No, you have to assemble your own bibliography. You have to show us the works you consulted. If this book does that, well, then I'll know right away what kind of histories of the Jewish ghetto this guy has consulted. But there's a good chance that he won't do that, <laughs> in which case I'll be guessing, I guess, the whole time, or I'll have to intuit it from the notes or whatnot. But it's a fruitful subject, is what I'm saying. There's a huge amount of documentation. So and maybe this will be uh, the year's first great Venice book. It could be. Well, I've read two so far. Both of them were really, really good. Uh, so uh, if this were a year of Venice books, I would be very happy about that. Uh, but anyway, that is uh, that is yet another uh, April TBR. We could, we could do these 
we could do these for days. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can, if you're interested, I'll, I'll judge by the responses and by the emails. Maybe I can work up another one, uh, for tomorrow before we actually get to April. So that you've got a nice overview of a lot of April books that, that might be useful to you. I'm always trying to be useful to you. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now. I've gone on long talking about prospective books always does that, but I'll be back. Thank you. Book two.